So overall, uh, the idea is that we are going to look at uh, Techstars Entrepreneurs Toolkit. It was developed um, in the last couple of years and it's uh, freely available to everyone. Um, it's on Techstars website. However, uh, what I found when I explained this, uh, this to uh, young startupers, they were very often confused by what they saw and heard there. Uh, not because it's not a good, a good material, it is a good material, but they need to somehow put it into their local context, uh, to the uh, Central European or European context. And, and uh, that's what we try to, uh, try to help in. Uh, these events uh, are all recorded uh, on Zoom, um, and um, each each of these recordings will be made available uh, later on on the website at globaltraction.org, and also on the uh, YouTube channel of uh, of Global Traction, uh, which is on uh, on on YouTube, obviously, and uh, we already have a pretty significant following there. Um, if you, if your question didn't go through, or you, you think that uh, you had a question later on about this particular topic today, or any in any of the following weeks, uh, feel free to uh, uh, write it in the chat, or after the event, send the question to uh, info at globaltraction.org, and obviously uh, I'm going to make sure that uh, your question gets answered from our expert or uh, from Techstars itself, because uh, you know, we are in a, in, in a way in communication. So to those of you who, uh, who may not know me, um, I'm working with Hungarian and Central European startups since uh, 2009, uh, late 2009, early 2010. Uh, so I've, I've seen a lot of uh, ups and downs and, um, and some new initiatives. I formed um, a, uh, an accelerator back in, two, back in uh, 2000 and, uh, uh, 12, and, um, and, and then later on, I joined another um, accelerator called uh, Digital Factory, um, met a lot of startups along the way. And basically, in short, what I've seen in the last 10 years is that uh, context matters a lot when it comes to startups. So it's important for us to understand how things are going in the rest of the world in the US or in, in the rest of Europe in order to, uh, uh, to react appropriately and develop a startup appropriately. Um, I had a lot of contacts with uh, the folks at Techstars uh, at the operational level with managing directors and also with the founders. And I had the idea that we could do this review course on the Entrepreneur's Toolkit that is uh, available as I mentioned uh, online. And, 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 and put it into context. So, you know, basically, if we do uh, these review sessions as a community, as a group of people who are interested in this, uh, we are definitely going to get further than uh, if we do it individually. So as I mentioned, um, you know, I'm, I'm all over the place when it comes to ecosystems and startups. Uh, so feel free to ask any kind of questions, but that's not the point. The point is to, uh, you know, go, go through the, uh, through the videos uh, provided by, by uh, Techstars, and then uh, basically pick our brains and pick the brains of, of our local uh, experts who are going to reflect on what, uh, was, what was heard in the videos. Today, um, it's my pleasure to, uh, to welcome uh, Barnabas Malmey. Uh, he is our first guest uh, of, of this day. And uh, let, me, let me turn it over to you, uh, Barnabas, uh, because you probably, uh, you are the best at uh, introducing yourself. Mm -hmm. And once we, we go through that introduction, then uh, we are going to get into the videos. Great, so I won't take uh, too much time up with that. Uh, I'm a partner at an early stage investment formation called Smartware Tech. Our main focus is hardware software businesses. So businesses that have uh, hardware components as well and uh, Internet of Things IoT businesses. Uh, we, are, we don't have an active fund uh, right now. We're doing portfolio management and raising our next fund. So unfortunately, we would not be able to invest in you if you're a startup at this point, but hopefully that will uh, soon change. Uh, I also work as a uh, head of business development at uh, the School of Engineering of a Hungarian university called ELTE. Uh, that's uh, a lot of fun. We're uh, looking at uh, various uh, research results and research groups and try to weave out uh, projects that are worth uh, commercializing. 
um, we're sort of at the beginning of this work, but hopefully it will bear fruit uh, soon. Uh, beforehand, I was part of other formations. I worked with one of the most uh, successful business angels uh, in Hungary in a formation called White Summer School Founder. Uh, and beforehand, I worked with the uh, uh, day one uh, portfolio group because that was at that point, uh, uh, basically one single group. Uh, it had an early stage uh, accelerator called Epic and I, I was the um, head of operations or CEO of that uh, tiny little formation. How about your uh, overseas experience? Yeah, I lived in the U.S. for uh, more than 10 years. Uh, I uh, was in a PhD program, which I never finished, but I was very, very close to finishing it in 2008. That's when I was closest. I defended it, uh, um, and it was actually in uh, the Bay Area, so the best place uh, uh, to get acquainted with startups, uh, although I was in a different field at that point, uh, but I still have some uh, contacts, uh, which come handy every now and then. And you are also teaching right? Um, it, yes. Related to innovation and startups. Uh, not so much related to innovation and startups, related to international relations and political science and political philosophy and stuff like this. So the, I, I was in a different field uh, and I was not on what is usually called as a, a tenure track. So I was just an instructor, uh, uh, something that is called Orado in Hungarian. So I wasn't uh, like a full professor ever. That's the truth. All right. So why don't we get started with this uh, series? Uh, this will be altogether about 25 minutes, if I calculated right. Uh, but uh, you know, typically, uh, Techstars videos are full of content, uh, and I can only recommend uh, to you to, uh, to review it. So let's get started. And uh, this is part one, create a business that works. Uh, I think it's a very nice starting point. What I want to do here is give uh, an introduction to the Lean Canvas, which is a powerful tool for describing your business. What I find is when you're kind of going from this initial idea, this allows you to take it to the next uh, level of detail. Very often when we start company formation, uh, typically the first thing that comes out is, oh, well, you need to make a business plan. Like you're not a business until you have a business plan. And often those business plans take the form of 20, 30, 50, 100 page uh, Word documents with a bunch of Excel spreadsheets. Because the notion is, well, you got to know kind of what your profit and loss is going to be. And three years out, or you can be profitable, what kind of money you're going to make. And to some degree, that is totally true and appropriate for what I call spreadsheet businesses. So these are businesses like lemonade stands, lawn mowing companies. Um, Companies where there's a really predictable market demand, there's a very predictable and typically low margin in how the company operates. Um, at, the, at the most grand scale, to me, airlines are an example of a spreadsheet business, which is if you put in all of the inputs and outputs of the business into a spreadsheet, all the ranges are pretty highly known. And with some math, you can get out very much a profit and loss view of the business. The challenge with high tech businesses and businesses that are leveraging some kind of asymmetric advantage in the market is they tend not to behave well as spreadsheet businesses. The inputs aren't particularly well known and the outputs are not particularly well known. And if you think about early business planning, the idea of a business plan, which is totally appropriate is create this plan to take the risk out of your business. In dynamic high-tech businesses, that same risk exists, which is you don't know exactly how the business is going to turn out, the dynamics around it. The challenge, though, is that planning will not get you any closer or will maybe marginally get you closer to the answer. The real practice that's important is building evidence, because only evidence will help you de-risk the business. To me, the power of the Lean Canvas is it is designed to help you de-risk the things that matter the most in a business in the early stages that a long business plan isn't very helpful at doing. Because what you're doing with, with one of those longer business plans is you're fundamentally uh, replacing uncertainty with false precision, which doesn't actually lower the risk to your business. So what we're going to learn today is a methodology and a technique which allows you to take fundamental risks out of your business 
in a very rapid iterative way where the document that you're using matches up the fidelity and your understanding of the business. So at the very beginning, what does that all mean? It means you don't understand much about your business. So you need a very lightweight tool to help you rapidly iterate on that plan, not to really build the business yet, but to systematically take the uncertainty and risk out of the business. We've been talking a lot about beating the crappiness out of your ideas. Now we're getting into the techniques of how do you beat the crappiness out of your ideas? And a big piece of that first is articulating, well, what is your conception of the business? What is it? And then doing it in a lightweight way where you're not attached to it and you can iterate through and replace your best guess with the best evidence you can create as fast as you can. Because the other problem with a nice, big, polished business plan is you tend to get attached to it. Like it takes you a lot of time to work on it. You get super proud of the Excel spreadsheets. You look at your three-year performa, which is that three years out, the prediction of exactly what the business is going to do. And you're like, wow, that looks like a really great business. Like that's an awesome business. Problem is it's all false precision. Meaning it's just a guess built on top of a guess multiplied by a guess divided by another guess. And all that math is just sort of combinatorial guesses, which means the answers are have a huge, huge margin of error. So the trick is to not get less margin of error by you know, polishing up the equations in the spreadsheet. You reduce that margin of error by getting out of the building and doing the work to build evidence around how your business is going to work. Best method, as I mentioned, is the Lean Canvas. This comes from Ash Maria. Uh, he wrote a book called Running Lean, which is a fantastic introduction to uh, lean startup and how to use these techniques uh, to go from an idea, or as he says, iterate from plan A to a plan that works. He then recently wrote another book called Scaling Lean, which takes these concepts and applies them into successful growing scaling businesses. This is um, some great work out there. And specifically what we're gonna go over here is the Lean Canvas. This is his tool, a very simple nine box worksheet that allows you to articulate and visualize your business in a very lightweight way. This is built off of the business model canvas, which was Alexander Osterwalder's PhD work. And that uh, work was around how do we create a lightweight tool to describe any business that exists and really think about categorizing businesses based on fundamental dimensions. So the challenge there was what are the fundamental dimensions? And then how do we create a tool to catalog all these businesses? The problem is that, that really started out in the domain of known businesses, businesses that are already running and working. Ash created this derivative to help you articulate emerging businesses, or when you're taking an idea from wherever it is today in some primordial soup and turning it into um, the process of making that business work. All right. So what do you think, Barnabash? I love this, I love this expression, false precision. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's it's very true. So are, are we going to stop after each segment or are we going to watch the whole thing and then discuss? I think, it's, I th I think if, if you have anything to say uh, at this point, then then you're more, more than welcome. Or if any any of the audience uh, you know, who are sitting here now online, uh, if you guys have any any comment at this point, um, let me just ask if, uh, if, does anybody have any problem with the understanding? Should I put uh, closed captioning on the on the video? Or it's... But it works fine. I'm I'm reading the chat. It's okay. It's okay. Great. Very good. Uh, actually, uh, from false pre precision, uh, my own business came to mind, uh, which I built um, uh, uh, quite a while ago, when. Um, we thought that we are going to have 2,300 uh, contracts uh, by the end of year one through a, a distribution network. And because we multiplied uh, one assumption with another one, it turned out that we were 95% off. So, uh, you know, I, I, I really feel the pain of, uh, of false precision. And I, I think it's, it's really a nice, uh, nice way to put it. Uh, <laughs> Sounding, sounding very educated, yet uh, being completely true to. Well, 
what we're going to go through here are the different boxes on the lean canvas and then i'll guide you through um, actually creating one uh, a, a prototype one for your business or kind of the early first sketch there's a stepwise way that you go through these boxes and fill them out and the reason is is that there tends to be a cascade when you have answers in one box it cascades down into the other boxes so there's certain boxes we think of first because evidence you build there has the highest impact and likelihood to change all the other boxes. So that's why there is an order to how we're going to go through these. And the first one that you want to think about first is the problem. What problem are you trying to solve? Now, this may be a problem that exists today where it's very easy to articulate. This is the problem people are having. Here's our solution to the problem. So easily understood by the market. Another powerful thing as you think about the problem is not the problem that your proposed solution is addressing, the lived problem that your market is experiencing. Now there's a challenge here, which is the problem may not be obvious initially to the market. You may be, you may be able to see into the future and realize this problem is going to emerge. People can't see it yet, but I'm a visionary entrepreneur and I can see the world's going to change and I'm going to solve a problem that doesn't exist today. That's awesome. It's also dangerous. So you have to be very thoughtful about how you approach future changes and future problems that are going to emerge. Another way to think about it too is aspirations. It may not be a problem that somebody has, but they aspire to make the situation they're in better. A lot of consumer products um, solve aspirations rather than solve underlying problems. <laughs> The next box we go to is the customer segment. Who is going to have that problem? So this is where we think about in the market, these are people that are often in the same situation. They often have a similar problem that's emerging. And very often they have a common language. They share a common language around how they would describe their problem, their situation, and the experiences they're having. Common language is important because this is a tool not just to help you articulate your business, but this is also a tool to help you take your product to market. And when you take your product to market, if you use your language, you have to teach people your language. If you use their language, you, you skip that step. And it's much, much easier for the market to resonate with what you're saying because you're not using your solution-based language. You're using their problem-based description or their aspirational descriptions. So that's how to think about customer segments. Also in here, we think about early adopters. Who are the people who are most likely to adopt this solution first? Because when you think about how technology gets adopted, it doesn't just get wholesale adopted first. There's always a handful of like crazy people who will try anything and they're your early first adopters. And what they, they're there because they, they wanna go on the journey with you. They think it's cool to be like the first person to have this gadget or the first person to get the benefits from this new product. And they're there just as much to be on an adventure with you as they are to use your product. So keep that in mind with early adopters. They behave differently than the rest of the market. And we're especially not talking. So on the opposite end of that are laggards. Laggards are the people whose VCR is still blinking 12, even though you can't buy a VCR anywhere, can't buy VCR tapes, but they still have that VCR because they only buy technology when it's impossible to buy the old technology anymore. And then they move to the next piece of technology that's nearly dead. So those are the last people you want to build your product for because they will never buy it initially. Your company will die before they get around to buying the technology. So don't cater to laggards, cater to crazy people who adopt anything kind of like you. You're willing to lean in and start something where nobody else is willing to start it. You want to first um, put your product in front of people who will not necessarily try anything, but they love the adventure of trying new things. Next, we think about the unique value proposition. I differ from Ash a little bit in how I explain this in that I like to think about unique value proposition as not what's unique in your offer, but how would your customer describe the unique characteristics of that problem going away for them? So if that problem doesn't exist in their world, what value does that represent to them? If that aspiration is achieved, what value do they get off of achieving that aspiration? So where possible, use their language. 
And then the high level concept at the bottom there is a way to give kind of a headline version of what you're doing. So if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, what are you up to? It's kind of like an abbreviated elevator pitch. Well, we're doing this for these people. It's a way kind of to create an analogy that allows people to easily understand sort of at a vague high level what you're up to, but not yet really at the deep specifics. Imre, if you mute yourself, then we cannot hear the video. You, get you cannot mute hold in one. Thanks. You learn about the other. And anytime you learn anything about these three boxes, please go back and reconsider all three boxes. Imre, did you want to go you back a few seconds? Because while you you to the potential customer Sorry. having or a version of what you're doing. So if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, what are you up to? It's kind of like an abbreviated ele elevator pitch. Well, we're doing this for these people. It's a way kind of to create an analogy that allows people to easily understand sort of at a vague high level what you're up to but not yet really at the deep specifics. All right, so those are the three kind of primary first boxes that emerge in this model called the Lean Canvas. What tends to happen here is these all kind of co-evolve with each other. So while I went through problem, then customer segment, then unique value, often what happens is you get a little foothold in one, you learn about the other, and anytime you learn anything about these three boxes, please go back and reconsider all three boxes. So when you learn something about a problem that your potential customers are having or some new language around how they describe that problem going away, go back and thoughtfully reconsider these three boxes. In my experience, these three always morph together based on your knowledge. Now notice also what I didn't cover in here. I didn't cover the solution. So the key concept here as you begin using this canvas is Get these three boxes figured out before you really dive in and jump to the solution. And when you do start building your solution, it's in service of building evidence and understanding about these three boxes. Who has what problem and how do they describe the value of that problem going away? Or who has what aspiration and how do they describe what their life, how their life changes when that aspiration is met? And if you're picking on a future problem, that it doesn't exist in the market today, you still need to understand how that person would describe that future problem. Because very often when you're in front of a market, the only thing you can rely on is your language. The key here is to learn what's their language for that problem emerging and then you making that problem go away. All right, so I, I, I just love how you know, how deep they want to get into the mind of the customer and not in the mind of the entrepreneur, but, you know, adopt that, that aspect. That's key. Fourth box we get to is the solution. This is where you describe what you're going to build and offer to the market to make that problem go away. So as you're describing the solution, frame it from the viewpoint of what you put in your customer segment what you describe as the problem and what you describe as the value. Next, we think about channels. Channels are how do you get your, your offer, your product to market? How do, you get, how do you activate people? How do you get them aware of what you're building? How do you get them aware of the problem? Sometimes you have to teach them the problem exists. So what mechanism are you gonna to use to teach them? What mechanism are you gonna to use to, to get their eyeballs, their attention? And then what mechanism are you gonna to use to close the deal? Basically get their wallet out. Because until you can figure out how to get somebody's wallet out, you do not have a business, you have a hobby. Hobbies are awesome, but they tend to be funded through other sources and they tend to have limited duration. So this is about building a business. And ultimately you need to figure out how to attract somebody to pay you money. And the channels are the mechanisms you do that. Next, we think about cost structure and revenue. Notice here how, how late these are. These are boxes six and seven in here. In a normal business plan, you focus on these two boxes first. You think of profit and loss. Again, for scalable high-tech companies, the math around profit and loss is not the biggest risk initially. You build a 
product that people want with the typical margins that are associated with high-tech businesses, and I will guarantee you the math will work out. Now, in the margins, it may not. As you start to scale, you may hit bumps, but initially, the biggest initial problem is the shape of the revenue and cost has to make sense, but not necessarily the details. So how do we dive into this? I like to think about businesses and from a standpoint of their business equation. If you were to be kind of a math geek about your business and write an equation that represents the money coming in and the money going out, what would that equation be? So for subscription type businesses, the most simplistic form of that equation is your revenue is what you charge monthly times the number of subscribers. So here, this forces you to figure a couple things out. What are the financial dimensions of the business? Is this a su subscription? How are we charging our customers? What is sort of the unit that we're using? Um, dollars per something. So here it's dollars per month, but it could be dollars per activation. It could be dollars per ad. It could be dollars per click. These are helps you understand, okay, what are the fundamental units that are involved in the revenue side of this business? As you think about subscriptions, um, there's a built-in often churn with subscriptions. So your goal is to add new subscribers while retaining as many subscribers as you currently have. So if we go one layer deeper into just this number of subscribers equation, we see there's three subcomponents to that part of the equation. And then if we deal, dig into that a little bit, as we think of the existing subscribers, we figure out, okay, what's our potential churn rate on those? Like per month, how many people are gonna say goodbye to us? And then we figure out what are the various channels that we're going to try to get new subscribers onto the system here. So if we think of like subs current times percent churn, so that's how many are falling off. That's a negative number if you represent churn negatively. Then new subscribers through the Google channel, new subscribers through the Facebook channel, new subscribers through um, brick and mortar channels. So this helps you now decompose down like, oh, well, how exactly are we going to get customers in the door? And then finally, as you think about getting new customers into the door, you start to think about, okay, well, if we're gonna get this number of subscribers from the Google channel, how much traffic do we need to create on the Google channel? And what's the percent likelihood that those are gonna convert? So now we see a little bit deeper down into the marketing funnel about what money are we gonna to have to spend on pay-per-click to get a certain amount of traffic seeing our presence on the web and then what percentage of that traffic is gonna convert into a trial or a new subscriber? So you see how this kind of drills down into various levels of math that help you decompose your business. Again, this isn't like the 15 page Excel spreadsheet financial model. We'll get to that eventually. This is just at the very high level. What are the mechanics? How are we making money? How does money come in? And then there's an equivalent side of this for how does money go out? And so what you get out of that is um, these blue numbers here, which are the inputs, the black ones are sort of carried down equations from um, or constants. So this helps you use a mathematical methodology to go from, hey, how does our business make money into what are the costs and revenue sides of the business? You don't want to take it any more detailed than this. Just think about what's the business equation and then capture that business equation into the cost and revenue boxes on the bottom of the canvas. Any comments, Barnabas? Well, we have only one to go, so why don't we listen to it and then we can start the conversation. Yeah, let's listen to the last one. Then we think about key metrics. What are we gonna pay attention to to understand is this business even working? So if I come up to you and say, hey, how's your business doing? These are the numbers that you look at. Very often, the easiest thing to think there is, well, we'll look at revenue or cash in the door, cash in the bank. Like those are pretty obvious ones. Every business has those metrics. Early product development though, those metrics mean almost nothing. Because for those of you getting started, you're gonna run your business for a while probably without making much of any money. So those KPIs will be painfully zero for a while. So then you gotta think about, okay, well, what are the key indicators that help me understand that our product development our customer discovery work is going in the right direction. And then the last box is unfair advantage. This is what do you have that nobody else has? 
Sometimes this is called the X factor, the 10 X factor. Um, what do you have that nobody can copy? The challenge with this box early on is generally you don't have much that other people can't copy. But think about what's unique about our experiences, our talent, our education, our background uh, that allows us to do this in a way that nobody else could copy. Very often, this box gets filled in much later on in the business. Uh, I'll give you kind of a, a cheat here. Most people write the team in this box in the very, very early days because you really don't have much else to write in there yet. That's why this is the ninth box. It's the last box you fill in. And if you need to leave it blank, that's fine. I encourage you to think about what's the highest level sort of unique thing that we have that gives us an advantage over all the other people who might be doing this. And the reality about business now is pretty much any idea you can dream up a few Google searches later, you'll probably see there's seven or eight other companies doing something similar. That's where you kind of be, um, challenge yourself to think, okay, that's fine. We're going to push through it. We're going to execute better than they are. We can see an angle that they can't see that angle right here into that unfair advantage. This is the order in which you fill out the canvas. And so if something changes in box two or three, it can cascade onto the rest of the canvas. Generally, if something changes in box eight, it doesn't necessarily change box one. But if something changes in box one or two, it has a high likelihood it's going to impact six, seven, eight. So think about the ordered um, nature of this. So that's a lean canvas. As you go from kind of idea to the next stage of pursuing that idea, I find that this is an incredibly valuable tool to turn the language of your idea, which tends to be very focused on the solution and now frames it into these nine critical aspects of building a successful business. All right, what questions do you have on the canvas? Yeah, so the question is around figuring out your business equation and revenue. Uh, should you do it for every possible revenue, uh, dimension of revenue, or just pick one? Early on, what I uh, encourage you to do is just pick one. Pick the one that you think is the most salient, is the highest correlation or linkage to the problem, the customer segment, and most importantly, your, the revenue equation, you should leverage the unique value column. If you frame that from what, how does your customer derive value from making this problem go away or achieving this aspiration, use that viewpoint as you calculate your revenue or your uh, business equation, the revenue side of your business equation. Does that help? Cool. What else? Yeah. Questions around, you know, as you learn about the business, if something gets invalidated on here, when do you know about wow, does this invalidate the whole business or just this little piece? Um, what I like to do about that is think about the cascade of it. So if something changes, let's say in box two, um, go to box three, four, five. Usually it's also good to check in on box one still, but look at the further boxes on and go, okay, based on our knowledge before this piece of evidence versus our knowledge after this piece of evidence, does it invalidate anything we've written in the other boxes? And if it starts to invalidate a bunch of them, then you know you've got a pretty big pivot or change ahead of you based on the piece of information you learned. The other thing I would do is run a few extra tests to make sure, like if that piece of information comes back and you're like, wow, this is a game changer, um, make sure you've got a decent sample size on that data run it a few, that test a few more times, do a little bit more work to make sure that you get a consistent stream of data back and invalidates everything else that you believe about the business. Unfortunately, usually it's somewhere in between those two extremes that I just painted. And this is now the art and the science of entrepreneurship. So what I'm teaching here is some of the elements of science of entrepreneurship and some of the structure around it. The art is the intuition you have as a founder where, or an early employee, entrepreneur in general, which is that intuition to look at and go, boy, this just feels like this changes everything. Or you stand back and he goes, I don't think, it just doesn't feel like it's changing that much. Trust that gut feel and back up that gut feel with as much evidence as you can create as fast as you can create it. Does that help? No? Cool. What else? Question was around the unique value. What, what's that box for? Um, as you start to identify the customer segment and the problem, who has what problem, then as you ask the people in empathy interviews, uh, describe the dimensions, the value of that problem going away, it's the answer that they give you, which is what does it mean to you that that problem goes away? Um, so let's say that 
um, your business picking on transportation. And you know your solution can get somebody from point A to point B 10 times faster. What you would put in that box is, if you could get to your destination 10 times faster, what would that unlock for you? What would you be able to do you couldn't do today? Uh, could you put a dollar on, amount on that for me? Those are the sorts of questions that would help you build the evidence about what your customers would put in that box. All right. Lots of food for thought, huh, Bernabash? Absolutely. I, I, I think this was really great and, and very focused and pointed. Uh, I, do, do you want to ask me or should I just uh, start speaking? Or I just, just want to, just wanna, um, you know, bring up some of the, some of the, uh, the words and expressions that he used, which I love. Cater to crazy people. I love that. Uh, because that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the early adopters, as we usually call them, but the crazy people who are, who are willing to try pretty much anything. Do you, do you find that uh, really useful in your practice? Yeah, I think it is very important to distinguish uh, what he called the laggards uh, from the early adopters. And usually the early adopters are crazy in one way or another. Uh, they, they are more hungry for the things that you are doing than sort of the average guy. And, and if you can find out uh, what is the reason for that, then you tend to understand your product through them uh, in the early stages. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a very useful uh, approach. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing that was really fascinating to me that even just, uh, you know, 10, 12 years ago, there were no real um, uh, methodologies for early stage entrepreneurs. And, and now he's talking about the science of entrepreneurship. So in, in the older days, and I think Eric Ries somewhere in his book uh, uh, talks about this a little, uh, it was either you were following the uh, methodologies and techniques of uh, large uh, corporations or else you would say that uh, there's not much I can do. It's basically just intuition and gut feeling and whatnot. And uh, through this sort of lean revolution, lean startup revolution and all the offshoots uh, 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 that uh, we have witnessed in the past uh, 12 or so years, uh, it's now, it, there's a very clear path. And, and, and it was amazing to see how uh, this guy just led us through a very rigorous methodology that, that keeps us really focused on the main question. So I... I thought it was a very, very good use of our time. Uh, uh, there was no uh, beating around the bush or, or the parts that we could have cut out of this video. That was very, very focused and very interesting, I thought. Yeah, definitely sounds like the real deal. Um, okay, so, uh, and the other thing is that, you know, it's the science of entrepreneurship, but at the end of the day, if you think about it, the lean methodology is the scientific methodology. You know, believe the evidence, uh, build on the evidence, make another assumption, test, test it out on a big enough uh, sample size. So uh, finally, some we made the connection, right? But we figured out that something like that works, and then we can turn to the huge, you know, scientific, uh, you know, part of the economy and realize, yeah, that's how it works over there also. So it's just an extension of that. Exactly. So that's the only way to get validated knowledge. Now it starts with hypothesis formation. So you have to form your hypotheses that you want to test and then try your best to test them. And, and earlier people thought that these in, in the uh, uh, situation of total uncertainty in the case of uh, early stage startups, you can't really do this because you don't have data. You, don't, you can't really base it on anything. And it turns out that's really not the case. Uh, and I really liked the way he started with uh, bashing business plans a little bit. And, and that is something that should be familiar to most of us here in Central Eastern Europe, because if you're just trying to raise 1 million foreign or 500,000 foreign, you are usually already requested to write uh, a business plan. And I understand why. I mean, uh, it's often said that it's the, basically the, the, the process of planning uh, gives a little insight about your way of thinking uh, to the investors. So it's not really the plan, but planning. But still, it, it very often takes you away from the real important jobs that you have to, to do. And, and I think this talk really showed it very well that uh, all these sort of profit and loss, you know, revenues and costs that come maybe number six or seven or whatever uh, cells in, in, uh, yeah. they were in. And there are other tasks that are really more urgent. And if you're not doing them because you are writing a business plan, uh, you lose focus and you lose time. And that's something that you probably cannot afford at the beginning or later. Yeah, yeah this extreme focus on problems and aspirations. 
Uh, yes. And so that sounds so unusual, uh, you know, in this part of the world where we always talk about the solution itself and celebrating the solution and the idea. Yeah, and it's not only this part of the world, to be honest, because yes, uh, yeah, exactly. I think, yeah, this is a point that really bears repeating any number of times because it's really alien to our own nature because we want we every, all of us think that we really already know especially our, in our own project we know basically everything better than anyone else could uh, and and now it's us of us that we really change our perspective and and try to empathize with our potential uh, customers it's very difficult to do and we have to remind ourselves all the time that we have to do it it's very easy to slide back into the mode when uh, we are looking at the world from our own perspective. And from our perspective, the solution is the interesting thing because that's what we are working on. Mm. Uh, so it's a very human thing to do, but uh, very, very important that we are not doing that. I recognize that, yes. So um, I'm, I'm asking everyone who is, who is uh, sitting at the computer, um, listening to us, if you have any question, feel free to type it or, or raise your hand and, uh, and uh, interrupt us. Um, in the meantime, I'm just uh, sharing with, with, with Barnabash my, my experience that, uh, you know, when, when I'm teaching Business Model Canvas at, uh, you know, various courses, I find, and I think that he was also a, a bit, uh, not struggling, but he was very attentive to the distinction between something that is abstract, because obviously talking about this canvas is abstraction, and how that abstract is related to the actual concrete specific cases that people have in their minds. And I think that's the job of the entrepreneur, listening to the guy, to a guy like him, uh, that, okay, he can only talk in abstract because he doesn't know what idea I, I have in my mind, but I have to translate it. He can never be specific, I can. And that, that's, a, that's the job of the entrepreneur. And often I find that uh, students of entrepreneurship don't, don't make that leap. They want they want you to make that leap for him, and it's uh, it's kind of difficult because you know an, an entrepreneur lives uh, uh, lives with uh, his or her idea twenty four seven, and uh, I only hear it for like two minutes. It's it's difficult to be really on the on the spot um, in 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 reflecting on the on those issues. So I'm I'm always you know kind of uh, suffering between art and science um, mm. and specific and 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 abstract because that's. That's how universities work typically, but in this uh, in, in this field, which is very practical and pragmatic, it's it's kind of sometimes it's difficult to constantly make those bridges. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think the, this tool, both the business model canvas and the lean canvas, and especially the lean canvas, is is great for basically holding your hands and uh, making you ask the the right questions in the right order. And that's why this was really useful. The same with the business model canvas, when, when you just show it to students uh, and they're trying to grasp the whole thing in one go, uh, yeah. I think it's, it's not helpful at all. But if you really know that for now, don't focus on anything but those three cells, those three boxes at the beginning. So what is the value that you create? Who are your customers? And what is the problem that you're solving? And just, just really gather evidence for, it, for, for these three boxes before you do anything else. That, that I think is really helpful. Because it's really, uh, it's a way, uh, we always say that idea doesn't matter, but execution does. And in terms of execution, it's really the focus is what the main question is. If you know what question you should be solving, that's a huge help. And these kind of devices, this tool, the, the, the Lean Canvas really gives that to you. In the case of the business model canvas, I find sometimes that, uh, uh, so people have an urge to fill in all the boxes Mm -hmm. And that throws them off every now and then because there are boxes that are meaningless in certain businesses. So I, I usually encourage people, yeah. again, just to focus maybe on just for a while, maybe six months into your uh, 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 company building or business building, just focus on two or three uh, uh, of, of the cells and ignore the rest. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What I also find, um, in, in my experience, what I also find extremely important is uh, I'm always asking people who are filling out these business model canvases that uh, the, the business model canvas is a piece of paper. It doesn't have the power to resist uh, the entrepreneur's wish to actually include everything uh, on that piece of paper. And very often they say that, you know, the, the, the canvas doesn't work because I fill this in here, fill this in there, and you know, I still I don't have any conclusion because they're not critical enough for themselves. So I think that this is also an exercise, this, this, this 20 minutes was an, was an exercise in, in how to be critical to your own thinking mm -hmm. and how to you know, basically reflect on 
facts and using his words, evidence, mm -hmm. and then make conclusions of, uh, based on that. And still, you know, what I loved is uh, that he gives way to your intuition, you know, your gut feeling. You may not have an evidence for that, but your gut feeling is that that's the right direction. And, you know, but just realize that that's a gut feeling. That's not a proof. Absolutely. So it's always a combination of science and art. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was a very smart point too. Uh, so, so, so one thing that interests me a lot, and, and I'm curious if uh, you, Imre, or anyone else in this group, uh, group has a, an opinion uh, on that, is the unfair advantage, which uh, is, uh, was the last uh, box that uh, uh, he talked about. Uh, and he basically argued that at the beginning, there's not much you can put in there anyway. That's why we leave it uh, to the end. It's usually just saying that our team is somehow unique because of the experience, the background, uh, the knowledge, uh, former jobs. Uh, and I, I, I'm wondering what your experience is regarding the most successful uh, early stage companies. Uh, I have a feeling that um, in the case of at least Central Eastern European companies, there is usually, in the case of the most successful ones, uh, some sort of a, a tech and or product advantage uh, that is um, either directly visible right from the beginning or, or at least it, it, it can be uh, suggestively uh, uh, can be seen. Um, but I, I'm really curious what your opinion about it, it is because uh, whenever it's only the team, uh, that seems to be suboptimal. So I, I, I haven't seen too many success stories coming out of Central Eastern Europe. Maybe in other countries, so in the US, if someone says, I'm a serial entrepreneur, I already built three companies, uh, th that is enough already, and we see what the unfair advantage is, but uh, rarely the case here. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, I totally agree that um, ideas and concepts and, 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 uh, and products in this part of the world are tech heavy. Uh, because that's where we are better at, um, in, by and large, and business and business development and sales is 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 not that not that of a strong suit and understanding business. And what I found is that the really strong teams have both, so they they are sort of living on the intersection of two completely unrelated businesses. Um, I've I've seen it many many times that when somebody who has you know a lot of competence in one field and just steps into another field, maybe for a half a year or a year, they would definitely see a lot of opportunities because these silos don't often don't talk to each other. And the solution may be here for a problem over here, um, only versed in, in, a, in a different way or, or uh, in calibrated in a different way. I think that, uh, for example, Airbnb is a good example how technology and, and business needs uh, and, and, and market needs met that was not simply satisfied by the hotel industry. They were thinking in one particular solution and they never minded the problem. And then somebody comes along understanding the problem and having the right technology and just leapfrogs uh, the, the, the current um, you know, incumbent, uh, incumbent industry. And I see it many, many other times. And I think that that's, uh, that's, a, uh, that, that's one issue that is difficult to put your hands on because yeah. it's murky. It's that kind of a, you know, gray area. And overall, uh, and it may be just a side remark, overall, I think the best startups come from the murky area, mm -hmm. uh, something that is not figured out, not regulated already, but, uh, you know, kind of still kind of a little bit of Wild West. Uh, examples like Uber, I think Spotify or, uh, or Airbnb, they all were kind of uh, seedy businesses in the, in the beginning. And mm -hmm. then over time, obviously, they had the good, the good sense of, going into the regulation and helping the regulation and formulating it and making making the regulators understand what it what what their business is so overall i think that um it's an art and a science and i think that a lean canvas is a good example of that but the mixture of it is is, is something that is really difficult to put your hand on but it's there and and i think that uh, as that the entrepreneurs have to be aware of that, that there is something other than just just the science of it, but they have to, they have to be there, their drive, their, their human aspiration to succeed is what makes a lean canvas into a, you know, a blossoming canvas. Yeah, 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 I totally agree. Yeah. So guys, anybody, anybody who, who, uh, who arrived in the last, uh, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 minutes, do you guys have any questions or are we following this uh, 
typical, <laughs> you know, sort of Hungarian community uh, uh, standards when two talk and uh, nine listen. Uh, I really, I really would like to invite you to uh, to contribute, even with a question. Yeah, Donny. Hey. You can't escape now. You know, you have you have we have you on with video. So. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, no, I mean it's just uh, I I think I joined them in the last 15 minutes or something like that uh, in the middle of the video about the link canvas and uh, what Barnabas is just uh, asked about this team is enough for here we need something I totally agree on it so team I think in this area it's not enough but it's still a super important part so yeah this, this is what I think lots of techie guys don't believe that, okay, they have their super cool thing, whatever is it, and they just think this, this is enough. And I think none of these two sides are right. So we have to have this, sure. this uh, merge of these two things, I guess. Yep. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, you know, some of the, some of the most, um, Kind of regulated and old industries like banking and insurance. I think that's why we see the, the, the biggest explosions there because those some of those people who realize that they that, that there are problems that technology could solve, but the old old guard cannot really engage new technologies. Uh, they are actually the ones who are this 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 army, uh, the fintech army who, who basically uh, you know revolutionized. Uh, you know, financial technologies around the world and insurance technologies also. It's it's amazing to see how what, what happens when those two competencies meet. One can calculate, the other can code. And then um, uh, really completely new layers, um, you know, spring up. And I always I always advise startups to, to think of these completely unrelated businesses because if if there is a sleepy old old fashioned business, it has to be revolutionized. It has to be reformed and why not be the first one among the first ones to, to re revolutionize those, uh, those, those sleep industries, like shipping industry, you know, it's uh, another prime target for, uh, for disruption. Yeah, this makes me think of, uh, so Ash Maria, who was mentioned, I think he is the originator of the, the Lean Canvas. He has this uh, concept of uh, the innovator's gift, if you guys uh, have heard about it. Uh, and, and his basic uh, claim is that uh, new problems come out of old solutions. Uh, that basically rhymes to what you just said, said Imre. So, so there's always uh, some sort of a solution for any problem that's out there, but there are problems with every solution. And then a new solution comes over and brings with it new problems. And I think one of uh, his examples is the music industry. So we had these old uh, audio tapes, uh, Imre, you might remember, maybe no one else in this group. Uh, and, and then at some point, we just found ourselves using CD, uh, CDs and no audio play, uh, tapes, because there was a problem with the audio tapes that you couldn't really find easily the start of uh, each song. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was a very particular kind of problem. Uh, and uh, CDs took care of it. But then when the CDs came around, uh, 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 people found uh, that there was another problem uh, with the CDs, uh, namely that you had to buy the entire uh, CD, even if you just like the single song. That is a problem that was solved by the iPod or uh, the sort of MP3 yeah. players. Uh, but then, and that was okay for a while, but not enough songs could be held on a single iPad. So streaming was an even better solution. So every single solution holds the key to the next problem that someone else can come along and solve. And that's basically a gift to the innovators, uh, argues uh, Ash Maria. And I think it's very often the case. Yeah, it's like an avalanche of solutions. Sometimes something always you know, brings, up, brings up another solution. Awesome. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Barnabas. Uh, as I mentioned, this recording is going to be put into a uh, podcast format. I'm also going to post it on YouTube and uh, Spotify. Uh, and so you can share it with others if you enjoyed it um, and you can follow up on it. Uh, there will be appropriate uh, linkages there. Next time, in two weeks time, we are going to um, have a different topic, understand your customers. Uh, the week after that, understand category design and then create new markets with category design, uh, product positioning, branding, 
um, get more done. So about in talking about uh, efficiency, uh, grow the business with KPIs. So a lot of exciting topics are going to come uh, down the line. And uh, I think that this is, I, I find it really exciting and really uh, um, uh, valuable uh, to, uh, to discuss these, uh, these topics because obviously we all know these terminologies, but it's always refreshing to have a different, different aspect to it. There will be altogether 20 sessions um, uh, from building Lean Canvas to the 20th, which is entrepreneurs' mental health something that we rarely talk about. Um, and each time um, I plan to invite uh, someone who is going to reflect uh, based on personal experience and, and, and the competence on, on, these, uh, on these topics. So thank you for being a good sport to be part of the first, uh, first run. And uh, I will obviously, I will definitely let you guys know when the next, uh, next event is going to be on.